I have some questions for you. Who is running from you? OpenShift 311 on bare metal on prem. Nobody? Okay, then my next questions are irrelevant maybe. Who is running OpenShift 4.10 on bare metal on prem? And we did it with IPI installation all on CoreOS. Uh, in an enterprise organization. Uh, also nobody. <laughs> okay, I will tell you about our uh, story. So, what we deliver is namespace as a service on top of ING container hosting platform. And it is completely separated. Uh, we, as platform uh, owners, uh, we develop uh, the platform, maintain the platform, and make all the compliance stuff there because we are a bank. So, and we also uh, make sure that uh, the, uh, the internal audit uh, department is signed it off. The namespace is completely responsibility of the owner of the namespace, normally the DevOps teams, our consumers, and they are responsible for what is running in the namespace. So they are responsible for the runtime uh, and the images that is running there. So can they, our consumers, install of create a namespace with OC admin. No, they can't do that. They can't do that. So we have in uh, ING our uh, ING private cloud uh, self servers portal and there they can request their namespace. And what they get, they get resources with MIDI cores and uh, memory, but also they get uh, a secure connection to the one pipeline where they can deploy this stuff. Um, they get also uh, a uh, registration in the CNDB, and they get also uh, an egress IP address to get connections to their backend systems. Oh no, they get not one uh, uh, IP address egress, but they get two. They will always install for them two namespaces on two uh, different data centers, and we make it equal for them. So, how we can do that? We have a lot of uh, own packages built around 36 to support this. One of these is the ICHP uh, API to orchestrate everything. We have a port and controller to create the namespaces in the cluster. We have the CDAS controller to make the connections to the one pipeline, the CID, CD uh, pipeline. We have the image reporter so we can see uh, with, an, with an API what is running in the uh, cluster, which uh, images are running. And we have also a quota autoscaler. Yeah. So it resize automatically uh, the, the, the resources in the namespace so it is efficiently used. So let me go make a picture. What we do, we have two data centers always. And then we order a lot, a lot of bare metal servers uh, from our internal uh, provider. We have a lot of APIs for the CBB for monitoring. Uh, security monitoring, logging, available. And on the other hand, we have the CICD uh, ING1 pipeline. On top of that, we have all our code in uh, Git repos, and we use the provisioning node to install completely automatically with the installer provisioned installation, the IPI method, complete everything on top of the bare metals, OpenShift, including the core OS on the workers. After that, we have all our own packages. We install them also with an uh, OpenShift GitOps uh, uh, method, and everything will install on top of the OpenShift. So it's running there at that moment. From that moment, the consumer can request via the uh, internal uh, uh, cloud portal a, a namespace, and then the namespace will create it with all these packages. And after that, Five minutes, some minutes later, he can directly install his application from the one pipeline directly in the namespace. All uh, is hands off, so we have a completely immutable platform and a computable, uh, immutable uh, workload uh, environment. So this is our environment, and Jan Willem will tell you more about how we build this uh, for our consumers. All right. So we have a lot of dependencies that we need to install in a cluster. Um, in the past, we used Ansible to install everything on all of the clusters. Uh, sadly, we saw that there were 
problems with configuration drift. We came across some issues on one cluster that didn't show up on the other. And uh, when we moved from OpenShift 3.11 to OpenShift 4, we really wanted to have a solid installation where everything is equal um, and that we pr use correct uh, versioning. Um, so we came across OpenShift GitOps and we started using it. Um, sadly, we had to implement it a little bit differently than what's supposed, how you're supposed to implement it. So what we do is we push a copy of the Git repository into the cluster, and then we use Argo CD to pull in the configuration from the, from the mirror inside the cluster. Uh, this solves some, comply uh, some uh, issues with the repository we have. We, we can't connect directly to it from our cluster. Uh, how does it look? So we have a CI CD pipeline that creates a um, output repo image and that output repo image is deployed inside the cluster. Uh, an Argo CD application is created inside the cluster and that ensures that all of the packages that we need are then pulled in and configured and installed. And in the end, we get into a state where all the features we need are there. Um, we created a demo, so uh, let's see if the demo works. So first we have the first package, which is the, we call it Azure Deploy because we deploy it with Azure. Uh, at some point it installs all the output repo images and uh, slowly all packages are being picked up and configured and installed and synced and yeah, it does everything. Yeah, I think it always looks pretty cool. The total time span is about 22 minutes uh, due to some timeouts that we came across and uh, we saw, with seeing this movie we saw some improvements that we can make in the future, uh, but for now it, it, it works pretty well and for us this is quite fast, so we're happy with the result. And the last bit always takes a bit. Yeah, it will come. Take some yeah, time. it will come. I recorded the demo, so I know it will <laughs> become green at some point. Quite sure. Yeah, I'm, well, I'm sure. quite sure. Yeah, we saw it before. <laughs> now nah, go further. It's over. Yeah. It takes about one minute the demo, so the f the, the beginning is always really fast, and now it's completely green. So yeah. <laughs> Um, so one of the features that we install is the project controller. This is a controller that uh, was made to ensure that all the namespaces that we deploy are uh, deployed in the same way. Uh, it uses a CRD which defines the resources the namespace needs. Um, it hardens the namespace to ensure that only the people that are part of the development team that requested it can access it. And it also ensures that there are some default network policies and yeah, all those kind of things. And it's based on the on a framework that we created ourselves, which we call the Scavos framework. It's a, it's a framework for operators, and you can write it in Python. And we build in that it also does an automatic uh, rollback. So how does the Scavos framework looks like? You create an app, and you create a Kubernetes object, a CRD. Uh, and um, it, it reads the custom resource and it ensures that whenever something changes or is created that uh, the operations are taken in. So uh, later in the second demo I will show you one of the C CRs for a project and then uh, it will probably be more clear. But uh, what we define in the CR is the, we call it purpose code, which defines the development group. Uh, the resources like CPU, memory, all the limitations that needs to be set if it's stateless, stateless or if it's a data surface. Um, so yeah. Uh, the scaffold structure has automatically created a event listener which has three, uh, three methods, create, update and delete. Um, each is called in order, and if one of these fail, it will automatically roll back the previous one it did, so that we always ensure that the state is how it's supposed to be and that we don't have any uh, incompleted uh, configurations or namespaces on the cluster. Um, 
but we have one problem. We saw one problem with the project controller because we used an outside orchestrator to configure uh, the CRs in the cluster, and that would then be picked up by the project controller. And to ensure that uh, we have the correct state across two clusters, because we always deploy in pair, uh, the ICHP API was created. And that allows us to just call the ICHP API, tell the ICHP API we need a namespace, and that ensures that the same CRD is, the same CR is created on both clusters. And it keeps track of the creation, and it also keeps track if you want to update the namespace. Um, the ICHP API uses three stages for us because we have some dependencies inside the organization. So for example, we first need to have a network ID before we can create a CMDB entry. And um, we need CMDB entry to connect it to the namespace because otherwise we don't know who owns the namespace. And uh, it would be nice to know who to contact if they have an issue. Um, all these steps are sequential, but inside each stage they're all concurrent, which is really nice for us because it saves some time with, with the creation. Some calls can take a bit longer, but uh, they are then already processed uh, when the slowest is done. Um, during the first stage, um, we also ensure that we have a high probability that uh, all steps that come after stage one are succeeding. So we check if the namespace already exists. We check if the CMDB entry already exists. We try to see if it might have already been, uh, there might be something wrong with charging. So if an API is not available. Um, but still, we cannot be 100% sure that everything will succeed. So in case the checks were successful and in the end the namespace was enabled to be created uh, during stage three, we roll back everything everywhere so that we don't leave any orphaned or stale um, um, entries somewhere. So it either was successful and it is created or it failed and we don't have any any leftover somewhere. Uh, another tool that one of my colleagues, Robin Siepman, created was um, a quota autoscaler. What we saw in the past was that our, um, our consumers request more than they, they need, and we had a lot of hardware that was unused, and still we were out of hardware. We couldn't create new namespaces. Uh, so he created a tool to ensure that um, in a certain um, frame, uh, an automation can check what, what the consumer needs and will scale down if it doesn't need it, and it will increase uh, if there's a burst of uh, resources required, for example, during an update. Uh, this way we prevent that uh, consumers are reserving uh, resources that they don't need 99% of the time. Uh, this lowers the cost for them uh, it also lowers the cost for us because we don't need that many many hardware anymore as we used to have. Um, so that's the second demo for, uh, that I want to show you. So uh, I talked about an IPR. Uh, I talked about the project controller. So this is in uh, the the CRD that we sent to the project con uh, to the ICHP API. Uh, it defines the quota, the CPU memory. It also tells us who requested it, um, the name of the namespace. And now we create it during the, by calling the ICHP API. And with the request ID, we can see if it was actually successful. So when we look it up, we see all the, running, all, all the stages and what the result is. Um, we see the, on the first few lines, we see running stage check, which is the check to see if there's a probability that it will succeed. Uh, they all succeeded, and in the end, uh, the stage three was also successful. This is the ICHP project object that the project controller uses, and there um, we see the actual uh, configuration for a specific cluster, and it has the same information as what we've sent to the ICHP API. And now we're gonna do a deployment and we have a limit of four CPU and 
uh, one gigabytes of memory, and we have a deployment that takes one fourth of it, so one CPU and 250 MB of uh, memory, as you can see here. And when we deploy it, it will, have, of course, be successful because we have enough uh, limit available. And it's running. And as we're going to scale it up to four, it will also succeed and it will also be successful. But we're now at the limit of our quota, uh, which will be problematic if we would, for example, increase it to six, which we're now going to do. And then we will see in the events that it was unable to create because we don't have enough uh, resources requested, uh, enough quota available to us. And what now happens is that a quota other scaler saw this event happening and it will uh, do an API call to charging and an API call to our cluster to ensure that the extra resources are requested for that namespace and it's assigned to the namespace and then the pods will be successfully running after a total of five seconds. And now we have six running pods instead of four. So that's the demo of the quota out scaler. Uh, for us, it solved an issue with uh, consumers really requesting a lot of unused resources. Uh, and we made it, uh, yeah, we are now using it in our newest uh, ICHP release. Uh, oh. um, we had hoped to announced that we were open sourcing uh, the three tools that uh, I just mentioned. Uh, sadly, we are a bit delayed with open sourcing it. Uh, our intention is really to open source the software that we show, uh, the, the tools that we showed, uh, but it will be a bit later. Um, please follow github.com ing-bank, uh, because we, when we open source it, it will be available there, and the names used here might slightly change, but uh, yeah. Keep following it, and uh, it will be there at some point in time. Um, we think, because we think, just like some other presenters, that it's important to also give back to a community that has given us a lot. Um, and now we're at a stage that we're quite close to what's used upstream, and we're not uh, stuck behind on OpenShift 311. We're now also using OpenShift 4, so that's, uh, that's a good thing, I guess. Um, I want to thank you all for being here and listening, and uh, have a great day. Thank you.